All right, moving right along here, uh, the next uh, topic that we're going to cover with respect to the Java programming languages is uh, conditionals and loops. Uh, so like all, or like most programming languages, Java has the standard if, if else, and if else, if conditional statements. Uh, th those really are all the same thing. And the, the if statement is just an if else statement with an empty else statement. Uh, and the if else if statement is just tacking on more else if conditions, else if, else if, else if. The else block is always optional. So really these are the same constructs. It's just some parts of them are optional. And so that's why uh, there, there's, there's really no distinction between them. Uh, we'll look at an example here in a second. But I do want to mention that Java does support the standard switch statements with a bunch of cases and fall through and everything like that. I'm not going to cover them simply because, uh, in, at least in my opinion, they're they're kind of error prone. Uh, switch statements are at least uh, because you always need a break. It, it gets kind of messy if you don't have break, uh, messy and fragile uh, with those break statements. Uh, but do know that in Java, at least as of Java seven, you can use switch statements on integer values uh, and string values. Uh, so if you want to check those out on your own, please go ahead and do so. Otherwise, I'm going to stick with the basic if, else if, uh, and, and things like that. In Java, when you use a conditional, your result has to be a logical expression. In other words, it has to evaluate to true or false. In some programming languages, you can have truthy, falsy stuff if it's dynamic. In other programming languages, you can use numerical values to indicate uh, true and false. That's not the case with Java. Uh, so let me go ahead and give you a quick demonstration here. So let me go ahead and just create a basic variable. And we can have an if else, st an if else statement. That's just a basic if condition without the optional else block. If you want an else block, of course, you can go ahead and use it. You can use uh, other numerical comparison operators. For example, if you want uh, strictly less than 10. And you can add else blocks or else if blocks. And so, of course, the second block would take effect and it would print out equals to 10. Remember, these are all mutually exclusive. Exactly one of these is going to execute. And so uh, if, we, if we change the value here to say 5, then the first one will execute. The other two will be ignored. If we change the value to 15, it'll be greater than 10. Uh, and so only the last one will execute. And again, the else condition is always optional. In this case, nothing will be printed or the last one will be printed, or the first one can be printed. As I said, in some programming languages, you can use uh, numerical values. For example, uh, you could use the value stored in A itself in some programming languages, uh, the convention being that zero is false, one is true. In fact, anything other than zero is true. Uh, but that's not the case with Java, as you can see here. If you put in a numerical value, that's five. Five is not true and it's not false in Java. And so it leads to a com compilation error here. In fact, it tells you type mismatch cannot convert from it into a Boolean. It has to be a Boolean value. Uh, so what you can do in Java is you can create, you can create flag values or flag variables. Uh, so let me go ahead and create a Boolean variable here, uh, is student. And we can set it equal to false. And then we can use that in a logical expression here. So the, the block of code that I have here is simply checking the value stored in this uh, Boolean variable. If it evaluates to true, then it prints out you're not, you are a student. And if it evaluates to false, uh, then it prints out that you are not a student. And so in this case, the second case will take over. If I had set that to true, then you are a student would, uh, would, would take precedence there. Uh, you can use a combination of, uh, of logical AND operators, uh, negations, 
uh, and other variables and, uh, and expressions. So a is less than 10, right? So if they're not a student and uh, the variable a is stored in a is less than 10, you are not a student, this will evaluate to false uh, because the first one is true. Uh, so therefore the negation is false. And then it doesn't matter what the second one is. Uh, that's something called short circuiting, which is in most programming languages. Uh, it doesn't even evaluate the second one because the first one is false. Uh, the first expression is false, so false and whatever doesn't matter is going to evaluate to false, so it immediately jumps down here. If I set this to false, if they're not a student and a is a strictly less than ten, then of course now it'll evaluate to true. Right? If you want an or condition. This will all be the same uh, because both of these are true. But let me go ahead and make one of them false by making this true. So the negation is again false. Uh, but the second one is true, so it'll print out you are a student. Even though you're not a student, uh, I'm just playing around here. These are just uh, toy examples. Right? Uh, so some other things to note here uh, that I'm using the default formatting. Uh, that uh, Eclipse gives me. In other words, everything is automatically indented uh, and then it's tabbed over, one tab over for each code block. Uh, within code blocks, it's tabbed over yet again. Uh, and the opening curly bracket is on the same line as whatever, uh, whatever that block is denoting, whether or not it's a, uh, a class, a method a signature, or an if statement. All of those opening curly brackets appear on the same line. The corresponding closing curly bracket is at the same indentation level here. Uh, now, if you prefer a different style, fine. I, I don't care. As long as you are consistent about it, uh, as long as you, uh, is there, if there's a style guide or something like that. Now, if you if you screw up and you get all sorts out of uh, all sorts of uh, out of whack here, uh, so some some bad spacing, some bad indentation, right? Well. This isn't very, very readable code anymore, uh, but great, great thing about an, ID, uh, an IDE, especially Eclipse here, is that you can reformat very easily. All I did was, as I'm on a Mac now, that's Shift-Command-F. On a, a Windows machine, it's probably Control uh, or Alt-Shift-F, uh, uh, Alt uh, something like, some combination like that, and it'll automatically reformat it correctly for you. As for loops, again, Java supports the standard for loop, while loop, and do while loop. I'll focus on the first two simply because do while loop is kind of fragile. Uh, it has not, it, 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 its syntax is different, its behavior is different. Uh, really, you only need one uh, loop. If you want to always use a for loop, fine. If you always want to use a while loop, fine. You can rewrite any loop as any other type of loop with these three. Uh, I prefer to use for loops and while loops when appropriate. For loops for uh, when you know uh, up front how many uh, iterations you're actually going to go. Uh, so if you're iterating over a collection of a known size or something like that. A while loop is generally used when you don't know how many uh, iterations you're actually going to go. While some condition continues to be satisfied and you don't know how many more loops it's going to, uh, iterations it's going to take you until that condition is no longer satisfied. Uh, Java also supports what are called enhanced for loops. Or Java calls them that. Uh, they're really just for each loops without the for each keyword, and I'll show you both of these in a second here. Let's go ahead and get rid of that old stuff. Uh, let, let's write a basic for loop to count from 0 up to, say, 9. Standard for loop for int i equals 0, i is less than 10, i plus plus. Right? Uh, again, this is the initialization condition. This is the continuation or termination condition. Uh, it'll continue while this is still true. So while i is still less than 10, it'll iterate again. And this is the, uh, the increment uh, statement where i++, it'll just increment i by one. Uh, let's go ahead and print those out. And when I do this, print them out one to a line, I get zero through nine. Again, it's because I start at zero. So the first iteration through here is zero. Uh, it goes up till 9 because when i hits 10, this is no longer true, and so it breaks out of the loop. If I wanted to go all the way up to 10, then of course I could use less than or equal to, uh, or I could go up to uh, 11 instead. Uh, I'll go ahead and keep it like this, though. The equivalent while loop would be, I need to declare a variable here. I st I'll start it at, at, at 0. Uh, the, the initialization condition happens before the loop. The continuation condition happens 
uh, you know, bound to the y key, uh, the while keyword in the body, then we have whatever we're doing. Uh, now, if I just did this, it would get stuck in an infinite loop, which is intentional here because I wanted to show you how to break out of an uh, infinite loop if you ever get yourself into this situation. Uh, most IDE, like if you were at the uh, command line, of course, you'd have some keystroke where control C or control X to, to terminate the current working program. Uh, but over here we have, well, if we started it with the, pl uh, the play button, we have a stop button right here. Right? You can clear out uh, the contents there. What I needed to do is I needed to make an increment statement at the end of the loop right? so that it would actually get up to 10 and break out of that while loop. Right? With a while loop, the placement of the body and the increment condition can uh, have a, a, a much greater effect uh, than, than in a for loop. A for loop, this increment is always done at the end of the loop. But if we, uh, in a while loop, we have the freedom to do uh, an increment condition at the uh, at this top. And when I do that, it only goes, let me go ahead and get rid of this for now. It only goes, it goes, starts from, it goes from one to 10 instead. And that's because the first thing that you do when you get into this while loop is you increment it. It was zero before you started. Now it'll be one on that first time that you print it through, et cetera, et cetera. It goes all the way up to 10 because it increments to 10, then prints it, then it comes back up here to the while loop, sees that 10 is not strictly less than 10, and so it breaks out of it at that point. Right. So be careful. Uh, and now let's take a look at what's called an, uh, what Java calls an enhanced for loop. Again, all it is is a, a, a for each loop. So if you've got a collection, say an array, which is what we'll talk about next, uh, or a dynamic collection like a, an array list, a set, or something like that, you can iterate over it without having to do the uh, the standard for uh, for uh, of creating an index variable, basically. All right. So just to show you the difference here, let's go ahead and create an array of the first few primes. That's an array of the first eight primes. Now, if I were to do this with a traditional for loop, I would do something like this. So I create an index variable i. I run it up to, but not including the, the size of the array. In this case, it's the length property, which we'll talk about next. And I increment it on each, uh, on each run of the loop. I'm printing out the ith value here. Now, you, as you'll notice here, it's complaining about this i. And this is something that I want to talk about as an aside. Up here on this first for loop, I, I declared i inside the for block, which means that it was locally scoped to this loop. In other words, if I tried to access it outside after that loop, set it equal to 10, it doesn't know what I'm talking about because the scope of i was only for this loop. I declared it here. It exists for this loop, but at the end of this loop, it no longer exists because it's out of scope. Right? Generally, you want to limit the scope of variables as much as possible to only to the scope that you actually need the variables. So if you only need the variable i for this for loop, then you should declare it like this. There's no reason you can create it before and then use it here, and now it does exist here. I can't declare it here now though. Right? I could have done it like this, uh, but then that uh, that means that the scope of this variable is now the entire method. Uh, I don't want to do that because I'm polluting the, the scope there. So I'll go ahead and restore that. Uh, now for a while loop, you can't really declare it here because you'd have to initialize it. Uh, so it is declared outside here. Consequently, down here in my other loop, it just means that I can't declare it again. That's why it was complaining. I've got two variables with the same name and the same scope. Uh, and so I don't want to declare it. Uh, note, note here that I can't use it before I declare it. If I tried to go like this, it doesn't know what I is. Again, scoping, you have to declare it. And from the de declaration all the way down to the end of the method, that's where it exists. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't work for the entire method. It's, it, it's not, its scope is not for the entire method. Uh, it only exists after you declare it. Right. So this is the traditional way of iterating over a collection, right? And let me go ahead and get rid of this. And this. So that over here in our console, we're only seeing what we wanna see. 
uh, two, three, five, seven, et cetera, et cetera. So we're printing out the first eight primes uh, which are stored in this uh, this array here. Now, if I wanted to do the, I didn't really use the variable i at all, right? Uh, I only used it to access the ith value. I didn't print it out. I didn't use it for anything else. Well, if you've got a situation like that, you can go ahead and create what's called an enhanced for loop. Now, this should be read as for each element that is an integer x in the collection primes. There's a colon there. Uh, now, in this loop, I've got a variable x. x changes automatically for me. I no longer need an index variable i and have to manually check it each time and manually increment it each time like I did in this loop up here. Instead, it takes care of all that for me, an enhanced for loop, a for each. For each element that is a, an integer, at, and call it x in the value prime, uh, in the uh, collection primes, go ahead and print it. And you have access to that variable x on each iteration, and it changes automatically. Now, when I run it like this, I, of course, get two copies. This is uh, the second copy here is the, the enhanced for loop here. So if you have no need of your index variable, you don't want to print it out, you don't, you're not using it at all, then go ahead and use an enhanced for loop instead. In fact, there are some collections we'll see in the next part uh, that require you to use an enhanced for loop.